So uh, take your Bibles, if you would, go to Matthew 5, 33 through 37. Let me read that. Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 through 37. This is your first time here, or you haven't been here in a while. We are going through the Sermon on the Mount and just chipping away at it. So today we're in a section about our, our yes, be yes, and our no, be no. So follow along with me in Matthew chapter 5, verse 33, says this again, Jesus speaking again, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it's the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black, but let your statement be, yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond these is of evil. So a little history on oaths. Jesus says in verse 33, again, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, make no oath at all. So in Numbers chapter 30, verses 1 through 2, says this, Then Moses spoke to the heads of the tribes of the sons of Israel, saying, This is the word which the Lord has commanded. If a man makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to bind himself with a binding obligation, he shall not violate his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. And then in Deuteronomy 23, says this, when you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it, for it would be sin in you, and the Lord your God will surely require it of you. However, if you refrain from vowing, it would not be a sin in you. You shall be careful to perform what goes out from your lips, just as you have voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised. And then Leviticus 19, verse 12 says this, you shall not swear by my name falsely and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. So there were two basic vows Jesus is referring to here. He's talking about a vow that would mean to perjure oneself, a, a false vow, swearing falsely. And then a second vow would literally means to enclose or bind together as a fence would bind something together or enclose it. Okay, this vow is bound by that which is petitioned on its behalf. So now God, we know God makes provision for oaths and vows in the Old Testament. Here's just a few. Genesis chapter 14, verse 22, Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. Genesis 21, now it came about at that time that Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, spoke to Abraham saying, God is with you in all that you do. Now, therefore, swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me. Genesis 24, uh, when his uh, father Abraham is talking about uh, Isaac and his bride, says, Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he owned, please place your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth. David and Jonathan, they made a vow in 1 Samuel chapter 20, says, so Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, may the Lord require it at the hands of David's enemy, enemies, Jonathan made David vow again because of his love for him. And then Psalm 132, one through uh, the first verse here says this, Remember, O Lord, on David's behalf, all his affliction, how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob. So many great men of God have made vows, and God makes provision for oaths and vows. And they're really a witness to their truthfulness and their sincerity. And even God made vows and oaths on certain occasions. Here's just a few. In Genesis 22, by myself, speak God talking, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord. Psalm 89, I have made a covenant with my chosen. Psalm 110, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. Jeremiah 11, listen to my voice and do according to all which I command you. So you shall be my people and I will be your God in order to confirm the oath which I swore to your forefathers. In Luke, in the New Testament, the oath. Uh, says this, the oath which with, with which he swore to Abraham, our father. So Jesus was rebuking the religious leaders to not make oaths 
or vows that were purposefully misleading and that were never intended to be fulfilled. This is what Jesus is talking about. Charles Quarles in his commentary says this, Jesus continued by prohibiting oath formulas that were intentionally deceptive. That is, that gave others the impression that a binding oath had been taken when the speaker himself did not regard the oath as binding and felt he was under no obligation to speak truthfully. So Jesus is rebuking them to not make oaths that they never intend to live by. Don't even make an oath. Don't even make a vow. Don't swear on anything. In other words, there was no intention for them when they would make these vows to keep it. Hebrews 6.16 says this, For men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath given as confirmation is an end of every dispute. So the oath or vow was given to give greater credibility. Somebody would give an oath or a vow to give greater credibility to this so-called promise that they're making. We often do this, don't we? We often do this uh, with our statements, to give our statements more credibility. We'll say something like this. We'll say, I swear to God. I swear to God. Now, we're told even as children, don't ever say, I swear to God. Even I, I didn't grow up in a Christian home, and I knew better than to say, I swear to God. You just don't say that because, oh, you know, you might get struck. But this is what we'll even do. And even if we don't say it with our lips, we mean it. I, I swear to God, right? We'll say this, I swear to God. I'm going to kill you if you do that again, right? Or I swear to God that you are going to pay for that. You are going to pay for that. Or, or I promise that I will pay you back. To our kids, we'll say this. I swear if you do that again, right? We'll say that to our kids. Or I swear if I hear you say that again or do that again, so help me, God. I heard that from my parents, even though they said you never swear to God. I heard that from my parents. Our kids, they'll swear all too quickly as well, will they not? They'll say to us, I promise I didn't break that. I promise I didn't break that. Or they'll say, if they're bold enough, I swear to God that was not me. It wasn't me, right? So ultimately, Jesus is saying here in the Sermon on the Mount that we have no right to make an oath or a vow. Only God does. Only God has that right. John MacArthur says, obviously, the Lord's promises made with an oath were no more truthful or binding than anything else he promised. It's not that God makes an oath because his word would otherwise be questionable or unreliable, but because he wishes to impress upon men a special importance or urgency related to the promise. So this leads us into the second point. So making a vow is clear of what happened. They were making vows and making oaths that they never intended to keep. This is the audience that Jesus is speaking to, the religious people of Jesus' day. They're making these promises and the oaths. They never even meant to keep them. So the second point is really what I would say is the main point of the message this morning that I believe it ties into this. It's the sovereignty of God. It's the sovereignty of God. I think this is the overarching theme. It's the title of the message this morning is the sovereignty of God. Look at verses 34 through 36 of Matthew 5. So Jesus says, you have heard it said. And then again, he goes the same formula. He says, but I say to you, all right, I say to you, listen to me. Listen to what I'm saying. I trump anything that you've heard said or any uh, manipulation of the truth that you have as a religious person. He goes, I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it's the throne of God, or by earth, for it's the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. In verse 36, nor shall you make an oath by your own head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. So what is meant by the statement, the sovereignty of God, or God is sovereign? What do we mean by that? When we say this word sovereign, it's not something we speak about or a normal English word that we would use in our everyday language. What does it mean to be sovereign? It means it speaks of God's complete control, his complete control, his complete power. Another term that we might use in describing this all-powerfulness or this sovereignty is we'll say the term omnipotent or his omnipotence. The word omnipotent, omni means all and P-O-T-E-N-T, potent, omnipotent is all-powerful. That's what this term means, 
all powerful. God, God is all powerful. R.C. Sproul said, if God is not sovereign, then he is not God. Either God is sovereign or God is not sovereign. And if God is not sovereign, then he is not God. So Jesus is declaring here that God is all-powerful. He alone is powerful. He alone is sovereign. Look at what I would call, as we look at this passage in, in Matthew 5, 34 through 36, it's what I would call a progression from grand to minute, from something grandiose to something minute. Look at it in verses 35 through 36. He starts out, he says, from heaven. Make no oath either by heaven, the heavens, all right? Think univ the universe, if you will. The heavens, and then he says, or by the earth, something a little bit smaller. Or by the great city, Jerusalem, something even smaller. And then he goes down to the minute, to the finite. He says, or to the hair on a person's head. Because why? God is sovereign over the heavens. God is sovereign over the earth. God is sovereign over everything, including every single city and all mankind and every hair on every person's head. God is sovereign. So Jesus is saying when we get into the last part, he says, but here's what you should do, which we'll talk about. That'll be kind of the application and conclusion of the message is what we should do. But we have to take it in the context of God's sovereignty, that God is sovereign. This is, why you, this is why you don't make an oath. This is why you don't make a promise. This is why you don't have to swear. Because God is sovereign. He alone is sovereign. We know God's sovereignty over all creation, right? We've heard the creation story. A few verses. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's your first verse in your Bible. I remember when I first got saved. Never read the Bible before, and a guy told me who had led me to Jesus. I said, well, how do, what do I do? He brought me a Bible, and I said, I don't know how to read this. He said, well, come. I'm having a Bible study with a, a friend of mine. Why don't you come on Friday morning? We meet real early. I went, and, and they were reading in the Gospel of John, and they were talking, and I didn't know what they were saying. And then I just I asked him if politely, could I stop you right here? And I went to Genesis 1-1, and I said, I don't believe this. I don't even understand. How did this happen? And so in his wisdom, he said, well, let's. Let's go, let's start with Jesus, and then we're going to work our way back to that, right? We're going to work our way back to that. But God is sovereign over creation. It says God created the heavens and the earth. It says God created everything in six days, Genesis 1, and in Exodus 20, verse 11, says this, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. And then God created everything out of nothing. It's the doctrine of ex nihilo. It's God created something out of nothing. Despite what the university says, despite what your science books say, despite what maybe even history books say, that God created something out of nothing. Genesis 1 and Hebrews 11.3 says, By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. Out of nothing God made them. Colossians 1, speaking of Jesus, Colossians 1 verse 16 says this in 17, For by him, speaking of Jesus, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Speaking of Jesus, look at the life of Jesus if you want to look at sovereignty. Was Jesus sovereign over anything? Did Jesus heal anyone? Yes. Jesus was sovereign. Did Jesus calm the storms? Was he sovereign over nature? Yes. Was he sovereign over the element of H2O? Yes, turning it into wine. He was sovereign over the seas when there's a great gale, a storm, and he says, just by his word, be still, and it stops. And his apostles go, oh, my gosh, he is even God over the winds and the waves. He's over the healing of sick. He's over the spirit of demons. He's sovereign over them. He's even sovereign over the power of death, raising Lazarus from the dead. And he's sovereign over the power of death for you and me. He's sovereign over that. That there will be a resurrection 
for those who are in Christ, a bodily resurrection that will live forever with Jesus. He's sovereign over that. He conquered death. He nailed the final nail on the coffin of Satan. Still working itself out right now, but it's been done. The victory has been won. Jesus has won. He's sovereign. So we see here in Matthew 5, 35, 36, 37, that God is sovereign. He's sovereign, sovereign over the earth, it says. It says that the earth is his footstool. That the earth is God's footstool. Right? Kind of metaphorical here. How big is a footstool? Then how big is God? And it says, as a cross-reference in Isaiah 66, verses 1 through 2, it says, Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where then is a house you could build for me? Says God. And where is a place that I may rest? For my hand made all these things. Thus all these things came into being, declares the Lord. God is sovereign over the great city of Jerusalem. This is the city of God. It's, it's the name of the city that will be the new heaven and the new earth, and there will be a new Jerusalem. God is sovereign over the city, and then God is sovereign over every single person. God is sovereign over every single person. Turn with me to Psalm 139. Follow along. I'm reading out of the New American Standard Bible. So if you have a hard Bible that's uh, in that, that'll be great. If you don't, you're just going to follow along. If you follow along on your phone or your iPad, go to the New American Standard Bible, N-A-S-B, to follow along. And this is what I'm going to read it in. Psalm 139. We're going to read the whole psalm. This, this speaks of God's sovereignty over every single individual and every hair on your head and every single cell in your body. This is the Psalm 139. Follow along with me. O oh Lord, thou hast searched me. This is a cry of, the, of King David. And maybe even the title above that would say God's omnipresence and God's omniscience. It says, O oh Lord, thou hast searched me and know me. Thou dost know when I sit down and when I rise up. Thou dost understand my thought from afar. Thou dost scrutinize my path and my lying down and art intimately acquainted with all my ways. What a beautiful phrase. You are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, thou dost know it. Thou hast enclosed me behind and before and laid thy hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from thy spirit or where can I flee from thy presence? If I ascend to heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there thy hand will lead me and thy right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely darkness will overcome me and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to thee and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to thee. Verse 13, for thou didst know my Form my inward parts. Thou didst form my inward parts. Thou didst weave me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are thy works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from thee when I was made in secret, and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Thine eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in thy book... They were all written, the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. How precious also are thy thoughts to me, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I could count them, they would outnumber the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Oh, that thou would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from, from me, therefore, men of bloodshed, for they speak against thee wickedly. And thine enemies take thy name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate thee, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against thee? I hate them with the utmost hatred. They have become my enemies. Verse 23 and 24. Search me, O God. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there be any hurtful way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. If you read that and you meditate on that, does that not bring for you 
as a child of God, as a follower of Christ, and even those who don't know the Lord and have a relationship with him through the blood of Jesus, does that not bring a warm blanket of comfort around you to know that you are intimately known by God? You're intimately known. What does it mean that he knows the hairs on our head? It's that God created every single human being. God created you. You had no control over your creation. Your parents didn't either. Only God did. Matthew 10, 29 through 31 says this. Are not two sparrows sold for a cent? Jesus speaking here. And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. Not even a sparrow will fall to the ground apart from God's sovereignty. And verse 30. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Every hair on your head are numbered, and it says, so do not fear, for you are even more valuable than many sparrows. So God is the one who is sovereign. And guess what? God, though he is sovereign over the heavens, and though he is sovereign over the earth, and though he is sovereign over the great city, he is also sovereign and intimately involved with you and even the number of hairs on your own head. God is not a God of deism. A God of deism believes this, the deist view is that, yes, God was the first cause of all things. But once God spun the world and creation into existence, he sits aside just waiting to see how things are going to play out. That's the deist view. It's as if a watchmaker, a, a craftsman, a watch craftsman were to take the intricacies of a watch and put them all together. And once he gets them all together, he winds up the watch. And once that watch is wound up, he watches all the parts work as the master craftsman. No, God doesn't sit as a master craftsman beside his creation and just watch things happen and hope that they play out the way that he wants to. No, God is intimately involved. He is sovereign over the hairs on your head and my head. He's completely intimate and involved over everything. From the universe to the one single hair on your head, of 7 billion people. Can you imagine the sovereignty and the powerfulness of God that he would know every hair on everybody's head and that God actually can turn that hair black or white? That God predetermined the color of every single hair on every one of our heads. And some of you have less hair than others, but you still have some hair somewhere. And God has determined every single one of those pieces of hair, that every one, every follicle, the color, all the way down. I mean, this is the intimacy and the sovereignty and the involvement of God. So a person who is finite and not sovereign cannot make an oath over the things that God is sovereign. You cannot turn a single hair a different color unless you bleach it. But that's not the color in the follicle. Only God can do that. 19th century theologian Albert Barnes, he says this, Neither shall we swear by thy head. This was a common oath. They would swear by their head. The Gentiles also used this, he says, as an oath. To swear by the head was the same as to swear by thy life, or to say, I will forfeit my life if what I say is not true. God is the author of life, and to swear by that, therefore, is the same as to swear by him. Because thou cannot make one hair white or black. You have no control or right over your own life. You cannot even change one single hair. God has all that control. And it is therefore improper and profane to pledge what is God's gift and God's property. And it is the same as swearing by God himself. This is the sovereignty of God. Only God is sovereign. And so Jesus continues on and he says that that's why you should let your yes be yes and your no a no. Because you can't control anything else. So just do what you say and say what you mean. Right? So this is the third point. It's the loyalty of man. This is a response to what Jesus is saying. God is completely sovereign and then God wants loyal people. Jesus says, but let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond these is evil. Anything beyond these is evil. Jesus is stating because God is sovereign, because he is in complete control, just say yes, 
when you mean yes and just say no when you mean no. Anything beyond that, Jesus says, is evil. Matthew Henry said, there's no reason to consider that Solomos in a court of justice or on other proper occasions are wrong, provided they're taken with due reverence. So a couple, uh, uh, two or three oaths that we would even take. You've got the presidential oath of office says this. I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of president of the United States and will do to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. That's the Oath of office for a president, an oath of a soldier going into the military would say, I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me according to the regulations and the Uniform Code of Military Justice, so help me God. The oath of marriage, we talked about Stephen and Isella. The oath of marriage that binds you in a marriage covenant. Stephen and Isella. When I got married, so I'm not sure if this invalidates my marriage. I don't know if I've shared this story in here, but I think it's funny enough to share again if I have. Okay, but I know some of you know this. So when Katie and I got married, I didn't even know what a vow was. I didn't know of marriage vows, okay? And so don't be shaking your head, Katie. So I don't know if this invalidates some marriage. If we need to redo it, let us know, all right? But uh, so, you know, when the, the pastor says, um, repeat after me, all right? And Murray, would you repeat after me? Uh, and, and he says, I thee wed, right? Well, I didn't know that's what it said. So I was standing up there in front of the church, and I said, I be wed. <laughs> I be wed. I mean, that was pretty good. And I wasn't even like a rapper or anything. I just said, I be wed. I'd be wed, so Katie still holds that to me. So I don't know if that invalidates my, my vow, but I made a vow. Marriage, there's a vow. And in the presidential oath of office, in a, the oath of a soldier, there are these vows. And so these are not the oaths that Jesus is addressing. These are not the oaths that he's talking about. Jesus is considering oaths that are unnecessarily taken as if, as if to make something that one says have more gumption to it, right? More oomph to it. More oomph behind it, right? Like saying, I swear to God to make it sound more powerful, as if you, you can't swear to God. Don't swear to God. You aren't in control. That's what Jesus is saying. So Matthew Henry continues. He said, but all, but all oaths taken without necessity are in common con or in common conversation must be sinful, as well as all those expressions which are appeals to God, though persons think thereby to evade the guilt of swearing. The worse men are, the less they are bound by oaths. The better they are, the less there is need for them. Our Lord does not enjoin the precise terms wherein we are to affirm or deny, but such a constant regard to truth as would render oaths unnecessary. Therefore, Jesus says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Jesus' half-brother picked up on this in his epistle entitled James. James 5, 12 says this, but above all, this is Jesus' half-brother, he says, but above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but your yes is to be yes and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. In other words, be a loyal person. Be a loyal person. Say what you mean and mean what you say. Be loyal. Be trustworthy. Be realistic. Be a non-pretentious person. This is the point Jesus is making. So why not make an oath? Why should we just say, yes, I will, or no, I won't? Because God is the one that's sovereign, so I don't need to make an oath. I can't even change one single hair on my head. He's sovereign over everything, as we've already established. And only God is in control of everything. So we don't need to make these empty promises. Stop making empty promises. Stop swearing by God's name. Stop making unnecessary oaths and vows. And just let your yes be yes and your no be no. How about that? How about if that's what we're known for? We just let our yes be yes and our no be no. For some of you, this comes more easily. I don't know if you've ever taken a personality test called the DISC, the D-I-S-C, and I know some of you Enneagram junkies out there, you can probably uh, be able to refer to some of these points, all right? But the DISC, just simply put, the DISC, D stands for lion, okay, someone who is kind of dominating the D, the I stands for otter, which is playful, loves to play, loves to just be with people, and then you have the C, the C is for a beaver, 
kind of conscientious, very structured. And then you have the S is the golden retriever. Mercy and love. So the beavers are like this. These are the beavers, the seas. They're conscientious. They're meticulous. They like rules. They like structure. They like consistency. And they hate it when people are wishy-washy. When people won't let their yes be yes and their no be no, C's hate that. And even D's often fall into this category. Now, the I's and the S's, on the other hand, they're sometimes so worried about pleasing people and they're so worried about what others think that they often avoid saying what they mean and meaning what they say. Now, a little side note here is this doesn't give anyone permission, the C or the D, to walk all over someone because they just are so much about truth and so much about being what's right. This doesn't give them permission to do that. I'm a D personality, and I'm guilty for sure. I learned this about myself, taking young people on mission trips overseas that I was so caught up in the structure and getting the mission done that I would often leave some carnage behind with people's feelings. So that didn't give me permission to do, do that. God really convicted me of that and has, has slowly maybe been teaching me how to show the grace that God gives. But I like a, I'm a realist. I like a person that, that's honest. I like a loyal person who says what they mean and they mean what they say. And, and I like it when somebody says yes and they do it. And they say, no, I can't do it. I'm not one that likes too much someone who's in between. So back to what Jesus is saying. There's no need to make promises or vows or oaths. Why? Because God is sovereign and he's in control. Swearing or making an oath is foolish. <laughs> Swearing or making an oath is foolish. It's, it's like luck is foolish or chance is foolish or karma is foolish. It's foolish. God is in control. There's no, no curveballs for God. God hits every pitch. He hits every pitch. You can't surprise God with anything. God is all-knowing, which is his omniscience, and God is all-powerful, which is his omnipotence. So you're setting yourself up for failure if you make promises. Just do what you said you're going to do. Do what you say you're going to do. If you say you're going to be at a certain place at a certain time, if you say... Everyone listen, if you say you're going to be at a certain place at a certain time, wouldn't Jesus want you to be there at that time? If you say you're going to be there, be there. And I understand there's some circumstances, but habitual circumstances, probably not. So be at that place at the time that you said you'd be there. If something privately is shared with you and you quote unquote promise that you're not going to say anything to anyone. Number one, you don't need to make the promise. Just don't say anything to anyone. Just don't do it. <laughs> Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Be a loyal person. If you sign a contract to do a certain job for a certain amount of money, then do the job. Do the job. You'd never tell your boss, well, I didn't make a promise. I didn't promise I'd do it. No. You wouldn't do that. You do it because you're supposed to do it. If you say you're going to pray for someone, wouldn't this matter? Wouldn't this be something that we'd be held accountable to, to not make a promise or not say we're going to do something and then, and then we just don't do it? Wouldn't this count here when we say, when we actually say to someone, hey, I'm going to pray for you, or hey, I'm praying for you, and you're not really going to pray for them, and you're really not praying for them? Wow, really? Really? Jesus would say, hey, if you're going to say you're going to pray for somebody, pray for them. And I would even say, pray right then. Don't even wait. Just pray right then so you don't get caught. You don't get caught not praying for them and breaking the, your yes and your loyalty and your yes being yes and your no being no. So Jesus says, let your yes be yes and let your no be no. Do what you say. Say what you do. A disciple of Christ is one who says what he means and he means what he says. So just do that. There's no need to swear about anything. Your oath or swearing on something doesn't change anything because you're not in control. You're not sovereign. 
All making an oath will do is to set you up to not keep it. So there's no reason and no benefit to the Christian to be inconsistent and wishy-washy. This word wishy-washy, I couldn't believe it. It's actually in the Webster's Dictionary. Wishy-washy, listen to it. The definition of wishy-washy, lacking in character or determination, ineffectual, used in a wishy-washy leader. He was a wishy-washy leader. Or lacking in strength or in flavor. It's weak, wishy-washy wines. Okay, some synonyms of wishy-washy. In the Webster's Dictionary, feeble, ineffectual, weak, vapid, spineless, limp, limp-wristed. I love this one. Namby-pamby. Half-hearted, spiritless, irresolute, indecisive. No one likes being around wishy-washy people, do we? And there's no way you can tell me you like being known for being a wishy-washy person. There's no way. No one likes being around wishy-washy people, and no one would like to be known as a wishy-washy person. So the bottom line is this, that God is the only one who is sovereign. He's His sovereignty means that he is completely powerful. He is completely in control all the time, every time, with every single person, in every single detail, with every single situation. You are not sovereign. You are not in control over anything. You're not over everything. You are not all powerful. And because of this, Jesus would say, be a loyal person. Just be a loyal person. Don't make these false promises. Be a trustworthy person who says what they mean and means what they say. Be a person who lets their yes be yes and their no be no. Let me pray, and then we're going to have Josh is going to come up and lead us in communion. And then we're going to have Stephen and Gianna are going to be in the back. Receive anybody for prayer. Anybody who would like to go back just for some private prayer time can go back there. So follow along with me, if you would, in prayer. Jesus, we come to you. We know that, man, when we hear these words that you continue saying, uh, that you have heard it said, but I say to you, Lord, every one of us for sure in here has to be convicted. <laughs> we have to be convicted because we, we continually do the very thing you tell us not to do. And God, I know that you, you're in control, and we're not. Father, you're in control even this morning. You're in control over every little detail. And you ask us, you are calling us to just be a loyal person, be an honest person. That we don't need to make false promises that would end up proving that we're dishonest anyway, Lord. Would we be people who are honest? Would we be loyal to one another? And God, would we recognize that you're sovereign and you alone are sovereign? Uh, Father, would we be men and women of our word and men and women of your word? Uh, Father, and we ask all this, that you would empower us. We ask all it in Jesus' name.